Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Due to the popularity of my CAN video, the video about controller area network, which I'll be sure to link in down below, I wanted to take a more advanced look at a different side of CAN, which is the CAN baud rate. The CAN baud rate, surprisingly, is actually quite complicated, and if you have to set it up from scratch, it's actually fairly difficult. And so I wanted to take a more advanced look at how the CAN baud rate works and how to set it up. Before we actually get into the CAN baud rate, for better comparison, I'd like to talk about the UART baud rate because that will give us something to compare and contrast what the CAN baud rate does. And uh, just about everybody has used UART in some way, shape, or form, so it might make it easier to link how the UART uh, baud rate works versus the CAN baud rate. The UART baud rate uh, starts off with a formula. Said uh, for the length of this whole uh, tutorial video, whatever you want to call it, uh, I'll be uh, more so specifically talking about the PIC 32MZ, but most of this stuff applies to just about any microcontroller. So, in a microcontroller, you have something that's referred to as the baud rate prescaler. The baud rate prescaler effectively divides uh, the system clock down uh, to get your um, get the speed of the particular uh, UART that you're using or so forth. And so the formula for the PIC32MZ is uh, FCY. I think that's the it's the system clock, the fact, you know, the letters themselves don't matter all that much, divided by 16 times uh, the baud And then uh, this will output you the baud rate prescaler, and then you load that baud rate prescaler into the baud rate prescaler register, and you're done. The thing to note with uh, the formula for uh, the UART baud rate is the 16. What is the 16 doing here? In the case of UART, what the 16 is doing is that uh, the UART clock is actually running 16 times faster than you would expect it to, because you would expect that, that you know, if your baud rate is, let's say, 9600, that the clock will be running at 9600. No, it's actually running 60 times faster than that. The reason for that is to be able to better align yourself with a message as a message is coming in because each individual bit gets sliced into 16 sections. So with uh, UART, uh, the bus always idles high and then uh, the first bit is always a transition from a high to a low. That's the classic UART start bit. And then the message after that, let's just make it something dirt simple that just kind of alternates back and forth for the sake of being able to draw it just a little bit easier. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the ninth, and then the tenth. So there's actually a bit sitting right here. I'll kind of put like a little notch because with UART, you need your start bit, which is a transition high to low, and then you have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bits. And then the uh, last bit, which is effectively the tenth bit, because you have a start bit here, the tenth bit goes high and stays high, and this lets the UART module know that we're now at the end of transmission. So what happens is, is each one of these bits is actually kind of subdivided, you know, into a bunch of smaller 
sections. The reason they do this is, like I said, is alignment. So the UART module is sitting there and it's looking for an edge. You know, you're sitting high and you're looking for a falling edge. Um, how it does this is irrelevant. If I, you know, was the one designing the silicon for a UART module, I would do this as like an edge detection so you don't have to pull, you know, each one of the 16 times to try and find the edge. But, you know, regardless, your mileage may vary kind of thing that the, all you really need to know is that the UART module is looking for this edge. When it finds this edge, Internally, it has a timer. That timer counts from 0 to 15 and resets. Uh, when this edge is found, the timer is preloaded with 8. And when the timer rolls over um, 8 later, 8 more counts later, you're sitting actually, erase that, roughly in the middle of this bit and you take a sample. As the message progresses, that timer will then overflow, you know, go to zero, and then count up 16. And 16 later is now roughly in the middle of the next bit. And this process continues as you take a sample in the middle you know, of each bit. And back to, again, the reason why they use 16 here is that, uh, let's say you're, as the timer is running and you're preloading 8 into it, you're actually part way to um, 9. And so when uh, uh, the timer uh, overflows, uh, this sampling point is actually, let's say, one time slice earlier. Well, You've got 16 time slices if you go from time slice 8 to time slice 7 inside the start bit, really not a whole lot happens. And uh, that uh, error will actually carry itself through the rest of the message. But again, if you're sampling at the 7th time slice of each message instead of the 8th time slice of this message, it, it doesn't matter. You're close enough to the middle. The other thing to note about the UART timing scheme is that UART has some amount of tolerance to error. And that tolerance is basically uh, uh, slightly less than a single, you know, what the width of a single time slice is. Because for instance, if you have uh, an error of one, you know, that's uh, the width of one time slice, regardless of whether it's um, in one direction or the other, probably it might be a little easier to see if the clock was running too fast. Maybe the, the module that's transmitting to you, you're trying to receive it, is running just a smidgen faster than you're expecting. What that does is it adds a single time, I'm sorry, it subtracts it subtracts a single time slice from each bit as you go down the line. And so if a single time slice misalignment here in the start bit is okay, as you start going this way, the samples will actually start to drift kind of toward the beginning of each bit and when you get to effectively the eighth bit now you're kind of sitting on the edge between the bits and so now you're not sure whether you're going to get a sample off of this bit or off of this bit and by the time you get here to the end you're already climbed into the previous bit here and now the message is misaligned so you're not sure which bits you're getting and this works both you know this is both an issue for if the clock is running too fast and everything gets you know the samples get scrunched together if the clock is running too slow and the samples spread out but sometimes you might get lucky but sometimes you won't and the message will get garbled to begin our discussion about the CAN baud rate, the first thing we have to talk about is the nominal uh, bit time. Uh, 
can has just like most other protocols certain predefined or certain standard baud rates and that baud rate you know if we draw the bit kind of like that it's kind of that boxy type transition-y uh, shape that you see sometimes, meaning that this bit could be a zero or a one kind of thing. But the nominal bit time is if we kind of go like this, the nominal bit time is the time it takes to go from beginning to the end of the particular bit. This nominal bit time depends on what your actual baud rate is. CAN can go as high as one megabit and actually it can go uh, substantially slower. Uh, there are some instances of CAN that can go above a megabit, but those are very new and at least for now they're outside of our discussion that we're talking about the CAN flavors, which I think is 2.0b that go up to one megabit. But anyway, so the nominal bit time is effectively one divided by what your baud rate is. So if your baud rate, for instance, is one megabit, one divided by one million gives you one microsecond. And so the nominal bit time for a one megabit CAN network is one microsecond. So the one microsecond is probably the easiest part of CAN and everything unfortunately starts to go downhill from there. Uh, whereas with UART, each message was divided into 16 time slices. With CAN, it's also divided into time slices, but those time slices actually have individual names. And so the first one, uh, is called sync. And it's actually time slice isn't the appropriate word there. Uh, it's actually time quanta. A message is divided, a single bit is divided into time quanta. That's what can refers to them as. And then those time quanta can be organized into segments. And so the first segment is the sync segment. Then you have the propagation segment. Like that. So this is the, let's call this SY sync, the uh, PR propagation. And then you have uh, phase one and phase two. So P H1 and P H2. So phase one and two. Exactly uh, why it's broken up this way will make substantially more sense as we further delve into this. But the, uh, the first important thing that I want to note is that the sampling point the point where the CAN module actually uh, samples to see what the bit is occurs at the uh, barrier at the transition between phase one and phase two. And so the sample point happens right here. This is very important to note that uh, the sample point happens between phase one and phase two. Now that we've gotten this bit of background of what the inside of a single CAN bit looks like, we now have to delve into the yucky stuff. And the yucky stuff is actually figuring out the um, actual baud rate. Why that's yucky, and I feel like the data sheet did a really poor, you know, for the PIG32 uh, MZ, did a very poor job of describing this is that you have to choose two numbers. You have to choose time quanta and you have to choose the baud rate prescaler. And it just described how that process is done very poorly. So time quanta. 
As I mentioned, the key and bit is broken down into time quanta. Whereas with UART, uh, you had a set amount of time slices, which was 16. With CAN, you can have anywhere between 8 and 25 time quanta that the a single bit is broken down into. And <clears throat> you get to choose, well, you know, how many time quanta do you have? The other thing is that the baud ray prescaler will give you the width of a single time quanta, and then the actual nominal bit time becomes uh, the uh, time quanta uh, time that's set by the baud ray prescaler multiplied by uh, how many time quanta you have. And the reason why it's complicated is because not all of them align nicely, meaning that you can choose a baud ray prescaler where uh, your time quanta are just a little bit too wide, and so you can't get an integer value of time quanta to land here at the tail end of the message. You will end up the tail end of the message, meaning the nominal bit time will end up in the middle of the time quanta. And so you get this kind of balancing effect where you're trying to figure out, well, what's a good baud ray prescaler and how many time quanta do I need? And, you know, it becomes very confusing. Uh, the way I found uh, works really nicely is if you uh, plug in your system clock, your baud ray, your baud ray prescalers and your time quanta into an Excel spreadsheet and you basically work out all of the possible combinations that you have, and then you use conditional filtering to show you what bond rates are available for you. And what we'll do now is we'll jump over and do a little screen capture on the computer to show you how that's actually done. For the Excel example, we're going to use a system clock of 100 megahertz and we're going to figure out the calculations for a one megabit baud rate. So like I said, Excel is probably my favorite way of um, figuring out what the uh, time quanta and uh, baud rate prescaler that I want. And so let's go ahead and actually do the calculation. So, uh, in the case of the processor that I'm using, my uh, clock frequency FCY is 100, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is 100 megahertz. My desired baud rate is going to be, uh, let's say, 1 megabit, which is 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like that. Now our baud rate prescaler is going to go here and that's zero one two and now we can just run this out to 63 like that <clears throat> and now we can calculate our uh, time quanta time That. And to do this, we need the formula for how long a time quanta is. And for this, we're going to jump over to the uh, uh, document. This is the family reference manual for the controller area network for the PIC32MZ. And the section that we're interested in is right here. Uh, BRP, baud rate prescaler. As you can see, the baud rate prescaler, when it's zero, all zeros, the length of the time quanta equals, I guess technically this is the frequency of the time quanta, equals two times one divided by FSIS, which it's the same thing we put as uh, FCY in the spreadsheet. And uh, 
as you go up you see this number will increment by one but this number is always one larger than the actual baud rate prescaler so we can use this formula to figure out what the i guess no this is the time quanta time is and so let's grab our spreadsheet again and so equals we're going to need to do, do, do two parentheses for this and so it's the baud rate prescaler plus one as we said that uh, we need this to be a one whenever this is zero and a two when this is one and we're going to multiply that by two close parenthesis and then we're going to divide that by the uh, peripheral frequency like that and right here is the time that you get for a single time quanta when the baud rate prescaler is zero and now we can take this and we do need to uh, fix one thing in here and that is uh, the frequency is always going to live in the cell here so we need to put a dollar sign for b and the dollar sign for one the dollar signs fix in the formula that the location of b and the location of one will never change enter like that and now we grab this guy and we run it down this way like that boom and here are all the time quanta times that you can get now we need the actual time quanta and so that's eight nine let me grab these and run these out and say it's from eight to twenty five time quanta like that and now we need to do a calculation for what the actual baud rate is and effectively the baud rate is the time of one time quanta uh, multiplied by uh, the number of time quanta and then inverted <clears throat> and so this equals one divided by the cell times the cell and similar to what we did originally we need to affix some of these and so for the time quanta three row three will always remain the same and so we need a dollar sign here and for the time uh, column b will always remain the same so we need a dollar sign here like that and so if your baud rate prescaler is zero and your um uh, you're using eight time quanta what you'll get is four five six so uh, a baud rate of what six hundred and twenty no six thousand two hundred and fifty k which is not actually possible but it is a value that you can put in here and now we can take this formula and drag it out this way and here are all of our baud rates and then we can drag it out this way like that and you can see that now we've effectively populated all of our cells with the different possible baud rates for the baud rate prescaler which gives you the time and the time quanta and so finally you can take this and to help you you can do some conditional formatting oh come on a little there we go so now we can grab the conditional formatting highlight cells and it's equal to we want to grab our baud rate cell like that and hit enter and okay and so what this spreadsheet will do for us now is that we can enter uh, any uh, frequency of our peripheral and any baud rate and it will highlight for us any 
a spot that matches. So for example, as I mentioned, uh, we're running our peripheral at 100 megahertz and we're using the one megabit baud rate for CAN and we see two cells that are highlighted red. So if we use a baud rate prescaler of one, we can then use 25 time quanta and that gives us the, that nice one megabit or if we use a baud rate prescaler of four, that we can use 10 time quanta and that'll give us one megabit. And if we just kind of generally scroll through the rest of the list, those are our only two options. And because we linked everything to our system frequency and to our baud rate, we can actually uh, live play around with some of these. So let's say 500K, 500,000, enter. And you can see that we have this one, this one, and this one lit up as our possible options. So, baud rate prescaler of 9, 10 time quanta, baud rate prescaler of 4 at 20 time quanta, and that's baud rate prescaler of 3 at 25 time quanta. And again, we can scroll through the rest of it and not find any. And we can continue this, so let's say 250,000... And here are possible choices, 125,000, and here are possible choices. Looks like for 125,000, there are the most. But back to 1 megabit, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, enter. For the rest of the example, and because it's just nice to work with, we're going to use a baud rate prescaler of 4 and a time quant 10 time quanta which gives us the one megabit before i leave the spreadsheet what i forgot to mention was that not only is the baud rate live but the system frequency is also live as well and that uh let's say instead of uh, 100 megahertz we were running at let's try 50 megahertz so one two, one two three four five six enter and at 50 megahertz, we only get one option for our one megabit bit rate. Or let's say we were running at 150 megahertz. There we go. And so uh, our options are now 4 and 15 and 2 and 25. And said so this spreadsheet makes it really that simple and again just to reiterate we're going to be using a baud rate of four oh sorry let me switch that back to 100,000 there you go 100 million like that so baud rate prescaler four and ten time quanta now that you see uh, how you balance out your uh, time quanta with the uh, baud rate prescaler and how many time quanta you have. Let's jump back over to this and actually show you how uh, the things interact. When you're uh, setting up your uh, CAN peripheral and you're setting up the CAN baud rate, the, uh, you will program in the baud rate prescaler and then you will use uh, how many time quanta you have to distribute them amongst the different segments. And the things to note here is that the sync segment always equals one time quanta. That's just how it works, that's it. The propagation segment can be uh, between one and eight time quanta. The phase uh, one segment can be between one and eight time quanta. The phase two segment can be between two and eight time quanta. Uh, the two requirement here, I believe, may be only specific to uh, the uh, PIC32MZ because I have seen some other like um, analog devices parts or whatnot that can do a one to eight here, but that's uh, I believe only specific to certain devices, and so ju I just wanted to note that this 2 may not necessarily be a 2. 
And so what you have to do is uh, it's one plus the length of the propagation, the length of phase one and the length of phase two in uh, the case of our example has to equal 10. This is where you, you it gets really complicated. And this is the area that can really make your head hurt. And that is uh, effectively after we get to uh, this point, you know, we know uh, what our boundary prescaler is and that we're using time quantum. quantum. Now we have to select our uh, the length of our segments. And the propagation one is usually the one that uh, all of the data sheets or whatnot talk about first. And let's explain exactly what they're saying. So as I mentioned in my uh, uh, original introduction to CAN video, a canvas is two lines. With a resistor at either end. <clears throat> like that. And uh, uh, peripherals, modules, whatever, are hung off of these lines where you have, you know, one off of a high and one off of a low, one off of a high and one off the low, you know, can high, can low lines, etc. What propagation is describing here is that uh, electricity does not actually move instantaneously or even at the speed of light. Oh. So what that means is that if a module on this end of the bus begins transmission, it transitions from a recessive bit to a dominant bit. Effectively, a wave is sent flying down the bus to this peripheral, the, you know, this module. <clears throat> And then this module uh, detects that and has to effectively reply to that same bit. And so the propagation uh, is actually twice <clears throat> uh, the propagation it would take to go from one end of the bus to the other end of the bus. And the speed of propagation here, uh, most of the data sheets that I've looked at say it's roughly two-thirds the speed of light <clears throat> uh, in a twisted pair. Now, you might wonder, well, why does, why is it twice the length of the bus? And uh, the reason for that is arbitration. <clears throat> when a uh, CAN module begins transmission, whoever happens to be the first module to jump on uh, synchronizes the bus. And that synchronization occurs inside the sync segment. So if uh, this module over on this far end of the bus jumps onto the bus first and sends out that sync pulse, that sync pulse has to travel all the way down this way, and then this module sees that, oh, hey, there's, you know, a message happening and they need to sync to it. So it will also put uh, its own sync pulse on the bus. And then that sync pulse has to travel all the way back this way. The fact that the sync pulse goes from here to here isn't relevant at the beginning. But what starts happening is that uh, now uh, all the modules will start to arbitrate. And the time delay between, or the propagation delay from this module to this module is the amount of time it takes the message to travel this way and then back again. Because this module here is now <clears throat> timed in such a way uh, that uh, it will start uh, transmitting one uh, propagation, the one bus length of propagation delay after this one. And so it takes a second bus width of propagation delay for that bit to reach over here. And what you're looking for is for uh, this module to be able to sample the bit in a location uh, 
in time that uh, the bit from this module has already arrived that it doesn't miss what's happening. And so uh, for one megabit can, the maximum bond, uh, the, the max, no, sorry, the maximum bus length is usually considered to be 30 meters. And if you do the math, I'm not going to do it live for you. I've actually already recalculated it before. For a 30 meter bus at a 200 million meters uh, per second, which would be two thirds uh, the speed of light, which is that the light is about 300 million meters per second. What you get is the uh, propagation delay from here and back to here is about 100 Uh, not 100, eight, sorry, 300 nanoseconds. There we go. 300 nanoseconds. <clears throat> so, meaning that the message takes 300 nanoseconds to go from here to here and then come back. What I hadn't mentioned previously is that uh, the time quanta length of uh, a not of the stuff that we've chosen, a one megabit bus is actually 100 nanoseconds. So the uh, the propagate of the, the time quanta, let's go, T, Q, in this case equals 100 nanoseconds. And so what the data sheet will uh, tell you is that you want the propagation segment to be as long as the propagation on the bus. And so what that means is that the sync segment equals to one, and now our propagation segment has to equal to three. If we because the propagation segment here is compensating <clears throat> for this propagation delay, that happens on the bus. After that, it just says, go ahead and choose your phase one and phase two. And that again, starts to be daunting. Well, what do I choose phase one and phase two for? The general rule of thumb is it's not a terrible idea to make phase one and phase two symmetrical. So if our sync is one, our propagation is three, that's four. So we have six time quanta left to fill. And so now we can go ahead and make phase one, three and phase two, three as well. So now this meets all of our criteria. Now, the thing that irritates me about the data sheet is that what I just gave you is the data sheet and you're probably still pretty confused about what's going on. Oh, well, how long is my bus, etc. And if you're actually designing your own system from scratch where you're laying out the entire bus all together, well, that's great. It's hunky-dory. You know what your bus length is and you can do these calculations. But in reality, uh, most often, particularly for tinkers, like if you want to plug into a car to read your CAN bus, that kind of thing, or if you're in an industrial setting and you're plugging into a CAN bus that you know could span the length of a factory, you don't know what your bus length is. And so the best strategy, uh, at least that I've been able to find you know, noted somewhere, is that you want to delay the sampling point to be as far back as you can because that compensates for the most amount of propagation delay in a bus. If your bus is short, uh, you're still within the nominal bit time and just the bit will arrive sooner, but you'll end up sampling it later and it's not really an issue. The only time it can become an issue is that if the clocks on the bus are fairly uh, inaccurate, drifty, or jittery, and we'll actually talk more about those issues a little bit later in this video. 
But a different uh, strategy that you could rearrange these with is that so you can delay <clears throat> the sampling point as far back as you can. And as I mentioned previously, the minimum uh, time quanta for phase two is two. So we can take this and make this a two. As I mentioned, and I'll get into a little bit more of the details, it's a pretty good idea to keep phase one symmetrical with phase two. And so we can also make this a two. And so six is always one, and you have two and two gives you five. And to make up the 10 time quanta, we can now make this a uh, five as well. And now again, we've met all of our timing requirements that sync is one, uh, phase two is a minimum of two, and then uh, the propagation in phase one fill in between one and eight, and our total is 10. Now, hopefully you're, you followed me so far as to how you actually choose your time quanta, etc. cetera. And, <clears throat> uh, I believe, as I mentioned in the Excel uh, portion of it, that you can also have a variant of one megabit communication with a 100 megahertz uh, frequency peripheral clock. And you can uh, use, uh, I believe it's a battery prescaler of one, if memory serves me correctly, and 25 time quanta. And the same kind of requirements could still be met with this kind of setup where, <clears throat> At 25 time quanta, uh, basically all of these parameters end up getting maxed out. And so your sync is still one, your propagation is eight, your phase is eight, phase one and phase two is eight. And so uh, eight, uh, eight times three is 24, and then plus the sync, sync uh, segment gives you 25. And so, so you can massage these kinds of numbers uh, how you want. Yet another thing to note is that oftentimes when you see uh, discussions about CAN and the bar rate, etc., they'll talk about uh, the percentage of sampling points. And so you'll get like 76% sample point or 80% sample point, etc. What does that mean? All that means is how far into the bit percentage wise do you sample? And in the case of the numbers we chose before, say one, five, two, one, two, because we're using 10 time quanta, and this is why I chose to use 10 time quanta, just so the numbers are a little bit easier. Uh, it's two time quanta to get from the sampling point to the end of the message. That means there's eight time quanta from the beginning of the message to where the sampling point is. And so eight over 10 gives you 0.8, which is 80%. So this setup here is an 80% sampling point. If we were to go back to the previous numbers that we had, where it was three, three, and three, that would be a 70% sampling point. Now, if you weren't confused yet, now we're going to jump into the most confusing part of the, the CAN bus baud rate, and that is the sync jump width. It's usually uh, uh, abbreviated as SJW, and the data sheet will tell you that the sync jump width can be between one and four, and the sync jump width has to be uh, greater or equal to uh, phase two. What the sync jump width actually is, is a neat little parameter which allows the bus to compensate uh, for drifty or jittery clocks on the fly in the middle of a CAN message. How does it do that? Well, first of all, uh, we need to talk about when the bus resynchronizes. 
So the original or what they call a hard synchronization occurs when uh, the very first module jumps out onto the bus with the sync signal. Everybody now syncs to the bus. They effectively start that uh, timer, kind of like in UART, which counts uh, your time quantum. Uh, after that, every time there is a transition, a bit transition from a recessive bit to a dominant bit, uh, the CAN module will check to see where that bit edge ended up. Did that bit edge end up exactly where uh, the, you know, right at the end of the nominal uh, bit time between the <clears throat> A recessive bit and the dominant bit, which would be you know, further down here. And if it did, well, then nothing need to change. Everything is hunky dory. But if that edge ends up being uh, late, meaning that edge is now further down uh, into the next bit than it was expecting, uh, what the CAN module can do is insert an additional uh, so many time quanta counts into the timer, which would effectively resynchronize uh, the uh, bit edges and uh, push the sampling point of the next bit further back. Did that make sense? I hope it did. Uh, and it can do this by between one and four time quanta. So uh, the bus can resynchronize re itself with a clock drift of up to four time quanta, assuming you set your sync jump width to four, all the way toward the end of the message. And so, you know, maybe at the beginning you'll insert one extra time quanta, and then a little bit later you'll insert a second time quanta, and kind of, you know, th uh, three fourths of the way the message through, you'll insert a third time quanta, and then finally you'll insert a fourth time quanta. Because, let's say, uh, the difference in clocks between the two modules uh, will kind of slowly drift because the one module, let's say, is running a smidgen slower than the other. That's what the sync jump width does. But the sync jump width can also go in the other direction because let's say uh, the clock for you know the first module here is perfect, it's dead nuts on. But the clock for the second module is a little fast. And because of that fast clock, the edge transition between a recessive bit and a dominant bit could fall actually slightly into the recessive bit. And so the sync jump width, it's a plus minus, can actually subtract out. So it'll reach into the timer and yank out uh, one of the time quanta. And so uh, the sample for the next bit will actually happen sooner. And uh, this sync jump width mechanism is what allows the bus to try and resynchronize uh, itself as it's moving. If memory serves me correctly, and don't quote me on this, the maximum number of bits that the CAN bus can transmit in a single uh, message is 129. And so uh, within that 129 uh, bits, uh, the sync jump width allows you to try and keep the synchronization that by the time you get to you know your 100th, 120th bit that you can still be aligned, so the sample point falls within the middle of a bit. Now that I think about it, I think I actually uh, screwed up exactly how I described this, and that is the sync jump width actually should be less than <clears throat> or equal to uh, phase two. Sorry about that. I just caught that. I did that wrong. Uh, because the reason being is that uh, the sync jump width uh, plays around in phase one and phase two. And this is also why I would recommend to make, uh, to make phase one and phase two symmetrical. So for 
instance here, in our example here, the sync jump width could be one or two. Because if you have a sync jump width of one, you're less than the width of phase two because phase two um, for this big 32 MZ has to be a minimum of two or two, which would make it equal to phase two. But the reason why we made phase one symmetrical is that uh, the sync jump width can push the sampling point either in this direction, which is phase two, or in this direction, which is phase one. And although the data sheet doesn't outright say this, the kind of impression that I got from stuff that I've read on the forums, etc., is that if phase one is less than the sync jump width, the sync jump width doesn't work properly going in this direction where the clocks are faster. Generally speaking, you normally don't have to worry about clocks being faster. Normally they're either right on the money or slower, but you can have those instances and you can have, an, uh, you can have instances of a jittery clock meaning that the clock frequency kind of drifts up and down. And apparently if it's a really terrible clock, this could happen, this, this drifting could happen in those 129 bits. And so the sync jump width might actually move that sampling point in either direction. But the general consensus that I found finally is that for whatever reason, there's very little information about the sync jump width online, but that consensus was that uh, you, to make a bus more robust, you want to try and maximize the sync jump width. And so uh, you may end up having to play that game of, well, how far back in one bit do I want to make my sampling point versus how wide do you want to make my sync jump width? Because in this example, to really maximize the, the sync jump width, you'd have to make phase two, four, phase one, four. But what that does is it pulls your sampling point out this way. And so four and four is eight. And your propagation segment here only gets one time quantity to play with. And so that sampling point may be actually too far forward because that would be a 60% sampling point. So that may actually be too far forward in the bit, uh, depending on the length of your bus. Now in the previous uh, video that I did about can, I mentioned bit stuffing and I mentioned bit stuffing really in passing. Uh, but uh, the sync jump width really explains the reason for bit stuffing. And uh, the bit stuffing effectively guarantees that every 10 bits, you will always have a recessive to dominant transition. Why every 10 bits? Well, on the CAN bus, you're not allowed to have more than uh, five bits that are all the same in a row. And so you can get a condition where uh, you have five dominant bits. And after five dominant bits, you have to have a recessive bit. So you'll have a recessive bit. And then let's say you have four more recessive bits after that. Well, what bit stuffing will do is it will force there to be a dominant bit after the five recessive bits. You can't have another sixth recessive bit. And because of the bit stuffing, uh, you are guaranteed to be able to resynchronize the bus, you know, to resynchronize using the sync jump width at most, the worst case scenario, every 10 bits. Now we've, so now we've taken a look at the, uh, the CAN bus spot rate. So at first, it seems like it might be kind of simple, but then as you look into it further, it gets more and more complicated. And we've looked at that within a nominal bit time, you have four different segments. Uh, those four different segments uh, describe uh, what happens inside the bit. Sync propagation, phase one, phase two, the sampling point, 
happens uh, between phase one and phase two. And I did also want to throw in a little tidbit in there is that there are certain module, CAM module in existence that even further try to be uh, more air resistance and they include something called multi-sampling. And so uh, they can actually take extra samples Let's say here, here, and here, <clears throat> they'll take three samples and then they'll compare them and see which uh, samples agree with each other. So if the first and second sample are dominant and the third sample is recessive, it'll go majority rules and uh, uh, the, uh, the bit sample must have been dominant, not recessive. So uh, we looked at how to set up an Excel spreadsheet to figure out what your baud rate prescaler is and how many time quanta you can wrap that into and uh, how easy it is to do using an Excel spreadsheet that you just basically put in your system frequency, you figure out, you know, you put in your uh, time quanta horizontally, your baud rate prescalers vertically, you figure out what your time quanta time is and then what your different baud rates are. And then using the baud rate prescaler, sorry, not the baud rate, but using uh, conditional formatting, there we go, you can get the spreadsheet to show you exactly your uh, baud rates of interest. And then we looked at how the different segments can be placed differently uh, to affect where the sampling point is and what your percentage of sampling is. Uh, we looked at how uh, the propagation delay affects CAN and that a message has to travel all the way to one uh, module and then back to the other and that gives you your propagation. And then finally we wrapped up with looking at the sync jump width. That the sync jump width allows the CAN bus to resynchronize the bus at worst every 10 bits. Now understand that this is a more advanced topic and if you stumbled across this video wondering about this you're probably ready to learn this topic but if you don't quite comprehend everything that's in here that's all right. So Rewatch the video, maybe let it digest for a day or two and watch it again and that will uh, help you process the information better. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you're always welcome to leave them down below. And as always, don't forget to give me a thumbs up if you like the video. And as always, uh, thank you for watching.